Hello, I'm Mark Staples, and I'm the moderator of a continuing series of legislative candidate interviews uh, leading up to the Montana legislative session this January uh, 2009. And the contender, this is this is brought to you by Bresden Communications, the Montana Cable Television Communications Association, and your local uh, community access channel, MCAT. And uh, my guests with me, uh, both of the contenders for House District 96 in Missoula, are on my left, uh, Representative Teresa Henry, uh, the Democratic nominee. And on the right-hand side is Stephen Eschenbrocker, the uh, Republican nominee. I, I will start, uh, I'm just going to do this alphabetically, uh, uh, Teresa, e F G H. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, uh, give us a little of your background uh, leading up to uh, today, personal history, education. Just a, sort of a resume of, to introduce yourself to the uh, the voters of Missoula. Thank you, Mark. My name is Steve Eschenbacher. I grew up in Hamilton. I uh, graduated from high school there in 1974 and went into the Army. Uh, I actually, was in the Montana Army National Guard when there was a Special Forces unit here back then. Uh, after a short period of time, I left the Montana National Guard and I joined the U.S. Air Force where I became a survival instructor. I did that until I left uh, the Air Force and went to college. I took the credits I had from uh, my military experience and went to Eastern Washington University. I then got a commission in the Army, uh, traveled around the world for about the next 17 years with the Army. And then after that, I retired from the Army and I took, uh, went to law school. After I graduated from law school, I opened my own private practice in Hamilton. And then in 2006, when the statewide Office of Public Defender was created, I went into it uh, with my best friend, and we are running the office in Hamilton. And so presently, I'm now uh, a full-time staff public defender in Hamilton. And I guess that's about it. Teresa. Thanks. My name is Teresa Henry, and I um, am a nurse. I always start with that. My day job is that I teach for the Montana State University College of Nursing here on the U of M campus. I've been a nurse since 1974. I've had all sorts of different jobs um, in acute care, chronic care, um, private sector, public sector. I've worked as a nurse practitioner and a care manager. I've been involved in, in health policy and political issues through my professional organizations, through all of those. And um, I guess you'd say my significant other, my husband is originally from Montana, and that's how I got to Montana. 20 years ago. In Montana, uh, the uh, subject on everybody's mind, uh, uh, probably across the country, is the economy. You can't escape it. As they say, everybody's talking about it. Um, and two interesting articles yesterday, the most historic meltdown stock drop. This is the beginning of October for those of you who are viewing this when we're taping this. And yet an article that said Montana is relatively stable. Um, I'd like to go right back to you, Teresa. What's your sense of the Montana economy, given that that's 70 percent of the job of a legislator is to deal with economic issues, it seems to me. And uh, is it satisfactory? Are we uh, bulletproof? Uh, what do we need to do to sustain it or improve it if you're elected? That's a lot, big question. Um, I would say that, that we're not bulletproof, but the Montana economy is usually has some insulation between the federal and the state economy. What we need to be aware of, though, is the effect that um, stocks, bonds, et cetera, have on our retirement plans, our, our ability to buy and borrow funding for our other um, uh, building project services that we're looking at. I think at this point I'm in a sort of wait and see. We are stable in 
our Montana economy right now, but we, I know in my job, people are very concerned about retirement funds and availability of those and the stability of those. I think that what will happen over time is that we will see a, a trickle-down effect that will have an impact on all of us related to stability of, of retirement funds, housing market, um, all of the things that, that ultimately we are all participating in. Stephen, state of the Montana economy with the, the national economy as a background and what needs to be done, if anything, going forward if you're elected to the legislature? Well, I remember growing up, we always used to joke that Montana never suffered the Great Depression because it never came out of the Depression of 1890. <laughs> but the fact is our economy is tied in inextricably with the national economy. We are lucky to a certain point that we didn't have the wild swings that they've had in other areas, but we still are going to have an effect. As I walk around and talk to people in the different neighborhoods, everyone's feeling the pinch. Uh, they're either, they know friends have been laid off or they themselves have been laid off mm -hmm. or jobs are cutting back or growth is stopping. What we need to do as a legislature is to try and remove the impediments to the creation of wealth. Government doesn't create wealth, it consumes it. And by that, what I'm trying to say is we don't create jobs except, as in the case of the public defender, we do those. But that money in order to pay those uh, public defenders has to come from somewhere. And what we need to look at is all of the strictures that are placed on the creation of wealth, uh, whether it's excessive regulation, uh, excessive taxes or things like that and we need to start trying to remove those move them along so that people can start creating their own businesses and one of the things on my website I talk about is the future is not going to be large companies employing large numbers of people it's going to be more entrepreneurial and so what we need to start looking at is a long-term tax and growth policy <coughs> which will reward entre entrepreneurs who will be trying to create the businesses and create the jobs that are going to be Montana's future that's what I'm looking at trying to do if I get to the legislature. Currently in Montana, as of yesterday anyway, uh, there was a $300 million surplus. It's projected to hopefully survive uh, till January, three to $400 million are the projections. Now I'm aware that that could all change if the price of oil keeps going down, the price of gas keeps going down. Good for the Montana consumer, bad for the Montana economy in a very odd way. But let's assume that there is a three to four hundred million dollar surplus when one of you arrives to represent this district. Uh, what are your priorities for a surplus if it exists in that range? Refund it? Invest it? Uh, increase it? What is your philosophy of what to deal with those kinds of funds if you get to elected to Helena? Stephen. As a small L libertarian, I believe in limiting government and I also believe in fiscal responsibility. For me, if we have a surplus, which is really going to be due to the oil royalties that are coming out of eastern Montana, what we need to do is first off make sure that the programs that are necessary are adequately funded. But at the same time, we need to look at providing property tax relief. Uh, property taxes are the second biggest source that we have for driving income for the Montana legislature to spend. Now, I will say there is one area that I'm particularly concerned about, and that's the issue of mental health. Uh, mental health is grossly underfunded. There are a lot of problems with how we deal with it. There have been steps that have been made in the right direction, but they're still not all the way there. Uh, that would be the one area that where I could like to see some growth, uh, but that's only because of the necessity. More people are dying from suicides than are dying in car wrecks. Um, so we need to be able to deal with those kind of issues of our fellow citizens. But as much as possible, we cannot raise taxes. Every time we raise taxes, we take away the wealth that is created by whoever is paying those taxes. But we reduce the opportunity for them to buy, to invest, to hire, or anything else. And if we can keep the economy stimulated by leaving government at the lowest level where it's functioning and producing what we need and actually need, not what we want, I think that will be the best shot we'll have to try and to maintain the economy and maintain growth for all Montanans. Teresa? Thanks. Um, I believe that we will be um, surprised at the 
availability of the of the surplus. I think it will probably. My personal projection is that it will not be as much as as we are hoping or predicting right now. Given that, I think that one of, one of the first things we'll need to do is look at the previous year's budget and the projected budget for this next biennium, and look at what we funded during the last legislative session that was one-time only money that would benefit from continued support, which does some of those things related to um, developing economic opportunities and support for people. I think that some of the education support programs that we've looked at, that we've done some uh, investment in, in capital growth in the university system, in some of the school systems, uh, computerization, all of those kinds of things would be wonderful. Um, I think we'd need to be aware. I, I personally would recommend saving some and or trust funding some to look at some things like um, providing opportunities for my personal preferences, of course, healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, dentists, respiratory therapists, et cetera, who have an opportunity to go to school in Montana and if they were able to then have some kind of tax credit to stay in Montana, use that to either pay back loans or invest in home, in, in home development development or buying a house, then that would be, a, I think, an opportunity for us to grow the, the, the uh, human resources that we need. Speaking of needs, and this has been a debate uh, since I started paying attention to the legislature, which was over 25 years ago, uh, the adequacy of school funding is always a debate in Montana, and, and uh, a debate that's been taken to court several times. Uh, one court decision said that the legislature needed to define it and needed to adequately fund it. The, the last two legislatures have poured significant new monies into aspects of legislature to the point where the current governor, uh, can, Democratic candidate for governor, uh, Governor Schweitzer, believes he's done what he could within the realms of possibility of the funds that are available. The, those who are championing more funding for schools have taken that assertion to court and believe that the state has not done enough. And uh, one of the quotes that comes out of that group is that adequate funding would uh, require somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 million more a year in spending. Uh, my question, and I'll go right back to you, Teresa, is are we adequately funding uh, public schools? And if we're not, either the legislature itself decides by agreement or a court orders that we're not, um, where do we come up with the money to, to do so? Well, first I'd say that, that my hope is that that, that suit um, is not, um, Past is not supported because I believe that we've made some significant strides in funding education and defining what quality education and some of the other pieces that we need to do uh, in that process. I think we, if we then say we've invested or proposed investing money into these programs, into the school system, now we have some time to say, what is the impact of what we've currently invested, and then come back and say, okay, let's look at outcomes, let's look at, at um, responses to what we've invested. I think that Montana is like a large um, family budget, and we have to say this was the most important issue during the last period of time, and we've tried to address that. And <laughs> And now we have some additional ideas that need to, that are bubbling up, that are going to take priority given the, the issues that we've talked about. Stephen talked about one with the mental health, uh, certainly um, children's health insurance, uh, coverage for uh, access for health care is, is going to be a significant challenge. The corrections budget is going to be significant. We, we need to look at all of those as well. Stephen? Education is necessary because the people that we are educating are going to be our future workforce. We want to have the smartest, most capable workforce that we can in our state so they can stay in our state. And it's actually there's two levels of education that I think we need to address. One, of course, being uh, uh, K through 12 and then also post-secondary. Right now, the legislature that Ms. Henry is a part of increased the spending in leg of uh, education last year significantly. We are spending the equivalent of $4,800 per student per classroom. The trouble is, is when I talk to my friends over here in Missoula, 
at the public schools, they're only getting about 2,400. So where's the rest of it go? And like any business, it goes to overhead. You've got the Office of Public Instruction, you've got all the supervisors, superintendents, the curriculum developers, you've got all this other stuff that is sucking away the money we need to get to the kids in the classroom. One, on my website, I do propose a completely restructuring of it because our education system is set up for an industrial age model. We are training students to work in a factory. What we need to do is relook at, rethink it. And one of the suggestions I came up with is to go back to the old one-room schoolhouse. If you have ever had a favorite teacher, you probably only had that favorite teacher for one year. But on the other hand, if your student, if your child could have a favorite teacher and they could have that same teacher for eight years, think how much more they would learn. What I'm proposing is that we give each parent of a child $4,500 voucher that they can take and have a teacher who is a professional where they'll contract with that teacher directly. So if a teacher wants to take, let's say, 10 students of varying ages, then that teacher would be paid $45,000, which is more than what they're getting now. And it would also leave a certain amount left over for uh, computer access and things like that because it's access to the internet is what expands our ability to interact with the world. As far as uh, the college education, I'm trying to make this quick. Uh, right now there's a proposal that uh, we give students, I mean, at the national level, every student a $5,000 tuition fee. Well, what will happen is that the tuition will go up $5,000. What I'd rather say is if you graduate from a Montana school or university, that we will give you a $5,000 repayment on your student loans as long as you stay in Montana. And the purpose of that is to keep the people that we're educating here and have them become productive and have them not have as heavy a saddle of debt as they do now. What about taxes as a general principle? The, uh, um, it's interesting, uh, there are car caricatures of, of both parties, one is not tax and spend in one is and I find that those things blur and they don't really mount up and uh, I find a lot of Democrats say we don't we can't do any new taxes and I find a lot of Republicans actually say well there's some things that we need taxes and and vice versa so it's a, sort of an interesting mix uh, one of the ones on the horizon that is very definitive and very easy to focus on is the proposal by the cities uh, to give all communities in Montana local option taxing authority. Historically, that ability to take a local option sales tax to the voters of that community has only been available for quote unquote resort communities where they feel that they have a very uh, you know significant f f flux of tourists to support these taxes that normally focus on alcohol by the drink. Uh, prepared meals in restaurants and lodging and other recreational expenditures. You know, they, they call them luxuries. The cities believe they have not shared in the, 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 the surpluses that Montana has been blessed with the past two legislative sessions and they feel that they are hard pressed, including your mayor, to meet their obligations in terms of infrastructure, in terms of spending, in terms of demanded services, and they would like to be able to take a bill, a, a, a proposal to the voters of these cities to do local option taxes on goods and services. Would you support that, uh, uh, Teresa? I would support the um the option for cities to consider it. I served on local government in the 2005 session. This this idea was brought forth by um, several communities and said, please consider it. It didn't pass in 2005. It was reintroduced in 2007, I'm sure at the behest and encouragement of, of Missoula and other areas. Um, I think it's one of the ones that we talk about local control. This is one of the very issues that, that a local community would like to decide. That way, if there is not interest in it, it would not happen. And if there is a way that we could say that some additional taxation is um, available as a resource for a community to cover needs, um, and, the, and the community citizens say that that, that worked for them, then, I, then I'd support it. So I, I'd support the option. Stephen? Well, I'm kind of mixed uh, opinion on that. One part of me says that, yes, everybody should be able to vote on an issue. My problem with the sales tax, though, is ever since I grew up in Montana, I knew that whatever I saw the price was, that was the price I paid. 
With a sales tax, it's always that little extra, and it may not seem like much. What happens with any sales tax, though, is it's easy to incrementally keep increasing it. Now, right now, I receive my paycheck every month from my employer. And if I'm not making my ends meet because I'm short on stuff and I really want something, I don't go to my employer and say, give me more money. I mean, I could, but they'll probably just say no. No, what I have to do is try and balance my needs within what I have and then prioritize within that what it is I want. I can't have everything. If I know that, I need to be able to bring it down. A sales tax is punitive, particularly on the poor, because they are still going to be out there using their only discretionary income is going to be going toward a sales tax much more than for the very wealthy. That's why I'm opposed to it. I know a lot of my friends in the Republican Party want a sales tax because it's better for business. I still am opposed to it just on general principle. Montana's always been a sales, free, a sales tax free state. It should remain that way. And we should not give local governments the option of being able to tax us further even though they may be claiming that they're getting an out-of-state tourists, it's still the majority of us who live here who are going to be paying that tax. And for that reason, I'm opposed to it. Stephen, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, the opportunity to close, um, maybe focus for a minute uh, on anything in particular you want to accomplish in Helena, take to Helena, a bill you want to support, some constituents request, or some things you want to go to fight. Uh, and then, uh, of course, make your pitch for the voters to vote for you instead of Teresa. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you folks that are watching. Uh, I have many issues, I suppose, but it's mostly related to my employment. I am now a public defender. I was in private practice. Uh, people would pay me, but now I'm dealing with the people who can't afford to pay. What I'm seeing is the way we write our laws and the way that we uh, deal with the, our defendants in the criminal justice system. If you are poor, it is extremely punishing. It is crushing on them and it keeps them poor and it doesn't allow them to um, make a, amends for their mistake and then get on with their lives and become productive citizens. So there are a lot of issues within the criminal justice system that need to be addressed. The other, my priority still has to be the issues of mental health. We have, within the Montana right now, if someone is threatening suicide, they have two choices. We either keep them in community-based placement, which means they could commit suicide because they're not going to be under any kind of control, or else we transport them to Warm Springs, which is still a very costly and expensive way to do it. Uh, what I'd like to do is set up regional secure facilities of maybe six to seven beds, which would only be used for four or five days long enough to get medicine st stabilized on people with mental illness. The other thing is, is the way the mentally ill are treated in the criminal justice system. Right now about half of our inmates in Deer Lodge are on some sort of psychotropic medicine, which means that they are mentally ill. We have closed all the uh, insane asylums, which was what the old term was, and we've turned them all into prisons. There's a lot that needs to be get done. There's a lot I want to try and fix because I see what the impacts are of these laws, and that's why I want to go to Helena, and I hope that you'll elect me to be your representative. Thank you. Teresa, opportunity to focus on some specific issues, and then your ask for the vote to be checked in the Teresa Henry box instead of the Stephen Ashton box. Thank you. I would like to return to uh, Helena for my third session. During this interim, I served on the Interim Health and Human Services Committee, and we've done some, I think, very productive work related to um, what we call transparency and pricing information. I'd like to, to be there to either carry or support that bill in the House. We also um, look at, by working through the health care forum, we're looking at a prescription medication monitoring program that would be directed toward safety while prescribing or while um, maintaining patient confidentiality and support. I am planning on carrying that bill. Um, we have proposed that we would remove the sunset from the hospital bed tax, which is one of the ways that in, in my understanding, it, it's one of the ways that some of the small hospitals in our community stay, are, allowed to, are able to stay open. I would also reintroduce my um, proposed bill on comprehensive sec health, healthy sex education because I believe that information is powerful and that young people w who have a, a good amount of information and get to practice skills in negotiation just like um, not, not participating in, in drug or other risky behaviors, I think this is a way that we could do that as well. So I have a lot of things on my list and um, I'd like to um, ask for your vote. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. As I told you before we started taping, I'm so impressed by the quality, the backgrounds, the experience, the, the education levels, the civic involvement of the candidates. You two are obviously no exception. I, I ask the voters uh, to uh, thank you for viewing and uh, listening to these folks who have sacrificed a great deal of time to run for these offices and will sacrifice even more time if they are uh, fortunate enough to be elected. Uh, it's a very thankless job. They serve us all with very tough decisions and I hope that you will do them the honor uh, of uh, voting for one or the other in exchange for the sacrifices they've made for you. Bresnan thanks you. Uh, the yeah. Montana Cable Television Association thanks you and uh, I thank you personally.